Hello, Ben. Welcome back. It's good to be back, John. How are you doing? I'm uh, I'm pretty excited. You know, I, we we get to do two versions of Rust. That's it's not every day. Not every day. Only once every three months. So <laughs> yeah. four times it, a year, four days a year. Definitely not a common occurrence. So so I'm in a I'm in a festive mood. I'm ready are to you? celebrate 154 and 155. Yeah, one of these releases is pretty short, so I think this first one here, 54, won't take us long to get through. Do you want to kick us off there, John? I, I feel like we say this, and then we always end up spending like <laughs> a ton of time on some really no, weird detail. All right, <laughs> This time, it is a pretty small release. All right, let's try. So 154 starts out with attributes can invoke function-like macros. And this one is, on the surface, pretty simple. If you have an attribute uh, macro, so this is something that starts with a, a square bracket and then an, an optional exclamation mark and then square brackets. Uh, if you have one of those attributes, previously, all you could do is sort of put fields in there. Like you could, you could write stuff that the macro then gets to parse, but now you can put macro invocations inside of uh, those attributes. So the example that they give in the release notes is if you use, you can use the include stir macro, which lets you give a, a file name and the contents of that file name get inlined into that place in the file at compile time. We should um, mention here, too, that the attribute used in the example is the doc attribute, which it might be a surprise to learn that there is an attribute called the doc attribute. Anytime you've ever written a doc comment, that is actually desugaring to the doc attribute. So uh, the example here is literally about letting you define doc comments in a separate file and then include them into the appropriate place for Rust doc to generate your uh, all your nice API docs. Yeah, and I think this is worth digging into slightly uh, more, which is if you write slash, 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 so a regular doc comment, what you're really writing is like pound sign square brackets doc equals, and then the text that follows the three slashes. Similarly, if you write slash, slash, exclamation mark for sort of a, a top level doc comment, it gets turned into pound, exclamation mark, square bracket, doc equals, and that same text. And you can mix and match these. So you can have some lines that are triple slashes and some that are pound, square bracket, doc. And that's where this feature gets really cool, where you could have something like, imagine you want to have a an example file that you also want to use as a example in documentation. Well, you could stick it in its own file, and then you could also include, stir it, directly into your documentation example in the right spot. And so it's really nice that these two can now be used together because it enables those kind of neat uses. Yeah, it really helps enable the whole like kind of a MD book pattern where you have all your markdown files in like a nice directory with like kind of a top level table of contents. But also if you want to have those like, you know, be included in your all your API docs. Plus, it also helps if you're reading code, having a lot of very long doc comments can kind of get in the way sometimes of understanding what the code like just I feel like I know what the code does I need to actually just read the code now uh so if your editor doesn't have any kind of like ni nice collapsing mechanism for doc comments which they often don't because they're kind of not really uh they usually defined line by line so uh you would need a pretty smart editor to actually make that happen so it's a nice little change well I use ed is that considered a smart editor oh that that's the I mean well it is the standard so yeah exactly that's all that matters it's, it's, it's great um, so the next uh, the next thing that's stabilized is WASM32 intrinsics. But what are intrinsics, Ben? Yeah. So when we say intrinsics, uh, what we're kind of there are, there might be a few different ways of interpreting it. But in this case, an intrinsic is sort of a thing provided by the platform. In this case, the platform is the CPU. So uh, in particular, the intrinsics that got stabilized were for SIMD support for WASM. And maybe you're like, wow, WASM has SIMD support? Whoa. And that it, is, it does. And it's pretty wild. And uh, I would love to at some point get a rundown of like how much crazy stuff WASM has that we like are just now learning about. But in this case, this kind of gives you a nice little uh, API for invoking the WASM SIMD intrinsics. Uh, and so uh, they are stabilized, they are here. And uh, a question that might, you might have is kind of like, well, if it's just like 
running a thing on the CPU, like kind of like a kind of a shortcut to a direct CPU command, isn't that just what assembly language is? And you're right. It is kind of just a shortcut for a single line of assembly. Although in some cases, uh, intrinsics can be a little bit better in that in this case, some of them are actually safe. Whereas assembly is always going to be just like unsafe. It's just a, bl a block of like totally uh, unknown assembly, haven't verified. Uh, in this case, a single like, you know, intrinsic can sometimes be safe. And it's and actually I'm not sure if honestly any other ones that are currently stable are safe. But for Ryzen 32, some of many of these actually are safe to, to call. So that's actually an improvement. Yeah, and it's also with WASM, I don't think you can write, like, I don't think you have the ability to write literal WASM, like WebAssembly. And so there, you can't even fall back to using the assemblies. You do need these intrinsics functions to to provide access to, like, the, the low-level primitives of the underlying platform. It would be cool if you could write, like, WASM. I'm not sure, like, if that's, like, an inherent... Uh... I, I feel like this is something we might get at some point, but I don't know how. I, I wonder awesome. if there's an effort. There's probably an effort there. <laughs> um, this also brings up a, a slightly tangentially related point, which is um, WASM32, as of 154, is also now a uh, target family. So if you haven't heard of target families before, if you've ever written something like conditional compilation thing, like pound, square bracket, config or CFG, and then like Unix or Windows, you've used target families. So target families are collections of target operating systems. So for example, the Unix target family, uh, which Unix is a shorthand for, includes Linux, but it also includes Android, for example. Um, similarly, Windows includes all the different versions of Windows. or uh, And now WASM includes all the different types of WASM that there are. They all grouped under the target family of WASM. It's sort of a collector for targets. Um, we got another thing in, um, uh, in 154, which is we finally got incremental compilation back. So you'll remember that in the previous episode, we talked about how incremental compilation was disabled because there were some corner cases that weren't like handled correctly by the compiler. And those used to just be like silently ignored. And now when they sort of enabled the way to actually detect them, they made them fatal errors sort of by accident. And then they decided they actually should be now all of, or all of the relevant compiler errors that have been detected by that sort of incremental compilation sanity checking, all of those have now been fixed. And so they've deemed that incremental compilation can now be re-enabled by default. There are still a couple, I think, minor ICEs that are pretty rare that are still being tracked. But it was, um, so they sort of made the decision that at this point, it's correct to turn it back on and basically no one will run into the corner cases. Happy to get this back. Because this, this uh, release came out about like, you know, six or so weeks ago, uh, all right, longer by the time you listen to this, we did go through the issue and to see if anyone has like registered any kind of new complaints uh, to see if maybe like, you know, there was uh, it was premature, but it seems like there was pretty much nobody who has been uh, noticing, at least not reporting any new problems with this uh, turning this back on. So hopefully uh, it all should be pretty good and uh, i think i believe i saw a comment from one of the developers working on this which is that even all the minor bugs should be resolved as of a recent nightly so it's exciting it's almost like things are getting better <laughs> <laughs> well a great way to make things better is to make them worse and then they get better that's so <laughs> um we're actually almost at the end of this release, so I guess you were right that it's fairly short. Although we do have some stabilized APIs and some some um, more detailed changelog items to go through. For stabilized APIs, uh, we already talked about the WASM32 intrinsics, which have gotten their own module under Arch called WASM32. There's some binary search things added to VecDQ or VecDeck. I don't know how it's pronounced. That we're not really going to talk about. They're not super interesting, but. One thing that, that did catch my eye here is that B-tree map and hash map now have into keys and into values methods, which was interesting to me because you could always do this with into iter dot map and to get out the keys and the values, but it is nice that now you can just get the keys and values directly. I think in practice, it's really just sort of a, a terseness thing, right? Like you can use fewer fewer methods to achieve the same thing. And this, um, when we talked about this before we started, you mentioned, Ben, that 
this sort of gets at the size of the Rust standard library. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah. So, I mean, in common parlance, I often see like Rust standard library compared to say Pythons or Go's where people say, okay, it's a small standard library. And I think that kind of uh, misses one of the dimensions, which is that Rust, like John and I both have this exact same conception, is that Rust standard library is uh, not extremely broad, but it is very deep, which the idea being that it does not have a lot of uh, a, a extremely large amount of like different modules with different use cases for like different kinds of uh, libraries, but it does for what it does provide. Like if you do have a module there, it has tons of convenience functions. You can kind of just like get lost, like scrolling down like you know the iterator docs of like finding out like a, what's all like the weird kind of like unknown methods that I'm not actually using. So if you ever like wanted to like increase your uh, your Rust. Uh, intermediate knowledge just go to the rust docs and like find a common api that you used before and like look at all the fun like little convenience methods on there yeah and all the trait implementations too i i think at this point we can start going through the the actual change log one thing that jumped out at me was cargo gained a new report subcommand and it currently only supports one kind of report which is future incompatibilities so this one is for basically a, a type of lint that's like, you may want to fix your code because in the future, this code may be an annoyance to you, either because it might turn into a hard error because it should have been a hard error all along uh, because it was really a bug, but we just haven't made it one yet. Or at a future addition boundary, this behavior will change. So we're giving you a heads up now in case you're thinking of adopting the future addition. And there are a lot of different things that are that are matched under this. So, as an example, um, the array into iter that we talked about, I think last episode, uh, is a future incompatibility lint that you're relying here on this auto ref behavior, and in the next edition that won't be there anymore. Or there's like um, there's a lint for constants whose values are impossible. So for example, you if you declare a constant whose value is like one divided by zero, then like it used to be that you could write Rust code that declared such a constant and it would only be an error when you use the constant and not when you declare it. But in the future, it's probably going to become a hard error to even declare one. And so this is an example of a future compatibility lint where you can do this today, but it it's really a bug and in the future, it's going to become a hard error. And so this is like a way for you as a user to be like, I want to be, uh, I want to be aware of things that are coming down the pike. Please, Gargo, tell me about them. Yeah, we should clarify too that, um, so normally all of these incompatibilities are just warnings and you should be seeing them by default in your own code. But what Cargo Report, I believe, is doing uh, is that it is showing warnings on your dependencies normally cargo does not display warnings that are in your dependencies so uh for example this could be a problem if there's some kind of future compatibility in a code that you a crate that you're using but it's not printing the, the warning so you have no idea if you're supposed to be upgrading or if it'll break under you which actually uh the fact that cargo hasn't been doing this is one of the reasons why a lot of these incompatibility lens haven't actually progressed very far and some of them have been open for a few years now just because uh cargo hasn't really been up the task of warning users that their code might break and so uh, hopefully this uh, represents a step towards making it so that we can actually move forward on these incompatibility uh lens that have been you know, kind of languishing for years and years now yeah, and part of the hope too, I assume, is that because you get to see it in your dependencies, you can then go and like try to fix them. Like you can submit either an issue or a PR to your sort of upstream dependencies and go, hey, I was told th about this lint from Cargo. Here's the thing that just fixes it so that your code won't break in the future. One more uh, little thing that I noticed, not in the release notes, but secretly, is that uh, 54 has turned on the mutable no alias flag once again by default on certain LLVM versions. Uh, and so we've maybe spoken about this before in the past. Uh, basically, this has been uh, normally, under, uh, normally this would not really be a big news. Uh, it's kind of just like it's one optimization flag among like, you know, thousands that LLVM applies to various bits of Rust code. In this case, kind of famously, it's kind of a... a 
comedy of, of errors where LVM uh, hasn't really exercised these code paths to the extent that uh, Rust uses them. And so every time Rust turns this flag on, some more miscompilation or error arises, forcing Rust to turn it back off again. And so, uh, in fact, this uh, it was tried to someone tried to turn it on for 53, I believe it was. And then a new error arose. And uh, actually, faster than ever, the problem was solved upstream and incorporated back and tested, and it has been turned back on for 54. Uh, as usual, as we historically, we shouldn't and expect it'll never this to be remain on for long. Now. I mean, <laughs> historically, that is not a, a good bet. At some points, you know, normally it might take you know, a few releases. But I mean, it's, at some point, you would hope that it's that there won't be any more miscompilations uh, detected. I mean, obviously, if there were any known, it wouldn't be turned on, right? And so, uh, it's it's it, we, can, we can be cautiously optimistic at this point. That I think maybe it's a they've all been dunk found now because I mean, it's been turned on and off before. And once you turn something off and then on again, then you know that it works. That's what I've been taught. It seems like they're getting easier and easier to fix each time. Like turnaround time for fixing these bugs seems to be getting smaller and smaller, which seems to indicate that the fundamental problems that LVM has in like, you know, tracking this data have been getting better. You know, they've been getting better and better at making it, you know, better tests, that kind of stuff. And it just so I, I am optimistic, at least, that maybe this is the time. Maybe we're finally done on this merry-go-round. We can <laughs> finally get off. I think I have two small things at the tail end here. Uh, one is that there's a new environment variable that's available for integration tests and benchmarks called cargo target tempter. The idea here is that if you have tests or benchmarks that need to generate temporary files uh, for like either for output or generating some input and then running over it, you can now, rather than write it to like slash temp, uh, you can write it into cargo target tempter. And this is nice for a couple of reasons. One is that you respect the sort of user's choice and uh, of, of where compiled artifacts should go. Like if they've set cargo target dir, for example, this will be under there. It also means you don't have to hard code anything like slash temp or maybe use like separate crates in order to manage this. You can just sort of dump them in there and know that it'll, they'll be private to your particular compilation. And it gets cleaned up by things like cargo clean. So it's just like a nice thing to be able to use. Um, the other is that Cargo, unbelievably, now has switched to version 1.0 of the Semver crate. The sheer irony. Yeah, it's great. So the Semver crate is basically the, the crate that parses version specifiers, whether that is a crate version or a dependency version specifier, and then matches the two up, right? So if you say this is... 30 version 1.0.2, um, or if it's saying I depend on 30 greater than 1.1.3. Semver is the, the crate that parses both of those and checks whether a given version of the dependency matches the dependency specifier in the consumer. And this is like, it, there's a surprising number of weird corner cases because there always is when you're doing parsing and matching. And David Tolney has taken on this like Herculean effort of rewriting the Semver crate, which was at like 0 0.10 for the longest time, and basically rewriting it from scratch and then walking through all of crates.io, like all versions of all crates and seeing that the new version of Semver matches the behavior of the old version of Semver for everything that Cargo cares about. And this is important, right? Because if Cargo upgraded to the new Semver and suddenly the semantics of a bunch of version dependency specifiers changed, lots of things could just break in unintuitive ways. So it was a lot of effort to get to this seemingly small version change. But it, it makes me really happy that we got there. Semver is such a, a fundamental crate that it's good that we're, we've gotten it to 1.0 now. And is that all we have to talk about for 54? I think so. I think we're on to 155. All right. First up in 1.55, Cargo. The greatest release so far. Uh, yeah, it's a, the, certainly the biggest number. Yeah. Cargo now deduplicates compiler errors. So I think this is just a nice quality of life thing. So like, you know, Rust is you know a multi-threaded application. And so in certain contexts, uh, you might get duplicate errors or duplicate warnings, even if you're doing cargo check or cargo test, 
that sort of thing. And so now those should be gone. And so I think this is like a great change because sometimes it is kind of like weird to see like, you know, you see like, you know, it printed one error at the end of your uh, compilation and you see like, you know, two or three different, like, you know, the, the same error, like printed above it. And it's kind of a little bit off putting. Uh, and so that's a great little quality of life thing. I don't think this has ever affected me actually, because my code <laughs> never has warnings or errors. Mm, um, mm, interesting. But, but it seems good for people who make mistakes. Yeah, that's definitely. That's, that's, <laughs> uh, I'm humble enough to admit that I do. It's once in a while. I did make a mistake once, at least a month or two ago. So. I see. You, you made you made one mistake. I see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The the next one is is cool, and I'm glad it made it into the release notes. So this is Rust now has faster, more correct float parsing, and I really recommend reading through the the PR for this, or at least a summary for it. And um, there's a good Reddit post as well that we'll, we'll link to in the show notes of just like what this change was but essentially it's a move from in or a move from an, a somewhat old and slow algorithm for parsing a uh, floating point numbers like from their textual representation into their like encoded f64 or f32 form uh, to a new sort of state of the art parsing mechanism that's like 10 times faster for certain data sets. And you just wouldn't expect parsing floats to be as hard as it is or the, for the performance improvements I mean... to be the kind that they are. <laughs> but it's just like, it it's so intricate and so cool that it can be sped up this much. And Some uh, of us do expect that floats are always harder than they seem. So that's fair. That's fair. But it, but I feel like I just never really thought much about this problem of turning a floating point string into a number being like an involved process. But of course it is. Like once I think about it, of course it is. But it just, it's just not a thing that I thought about. And these are not just uh, performance improvements, although those are nice. It also is a correctness improvement because uh, the old float parser could not parse various strangely formed strings. Uh, it would just give you an error, a parsing error, if you even tried. So uh, it is both faster and more correct, and it's great. Yeah, I think I saw the PR closest, like, what was it like eight different known issues with the old parser? It's great. The next one is a, a somewhat different kind of, uh, of change, which is that the error kind type or enum under standard IO has its variance updated. So error kind is a an enum that's marked as non-exhaustive, which lets you classify an enum or a type as um, not being possible to exhaustively match on or construct. The idea here is that as the standard library authors want the ability to add new variants over time, right? So for example, error kind um, used to not have an out of memory variant, but there are sort of operating system errors that indicate out of memory, and you want the ability to propagate that accurately as the right error kind. Um, but because it didn't exist in the past and they want to add it, the only way to do that in a way where it's not a backwards incompatible change is to mark the enum as being non-exhaustive so that no one can have, for example, a match on error kind that tries to enumerate, a, enumerate every single case and not have an underscore clause. Because if they did, if they could have such a match, then adding a variant would be a breaking change because that match would no longer compile complaining about the missing new variant. Um, but in practice, they haven't really been adding new variants to error kind. And I don't really know why. Maybe they just didn't have a cause to, but that's something that's changing now. And it's changing partially because there's this one variant called other, which is used in the standard library to express errors that couldn't be classified yet. So this is stuff like out of memory, for example, in the past, where it didn't really have an error variant and they didn't, an error kind variant, and they didn't add one. It just got grouped into this other category. The problem was that the other variant is also accessible to users. And so a lot of sort of crates in the in the crates.io ecosystem and in, and in the broader ecosystem were creating errors using this other variant. And then consumers of those errors were like trying to like match on the other error kind. And if they were that, then they assumed that it was a particular kind of error coming from below. And this just 
started blurring the lines between what is really an error from the operating system and what is like a user generated error. So what they did in 155 was they added a new variant called uncategorized. And then they changed everywhere in the standard library that generated an other error kind previously to generating an uncategorized error kind instead. And the crucial difference between uncategorized and other is that uncategorized is a variant that cannot be named by user code. So you cannot, in user code, generate an error that has the uncategorized error kind. So now, going forward, other the other variant uh, will always be known to be user-generated errors, and uncategorized will always be known to be sort of system-level errors. And I think part of the reason they did this was so that it's not a breaking change or it's not as disruptive of a change, I should say, for them to change the error kind of an existing error from uncategorized to, for example, out of memory. So in the past, right, someone might have relied on out of memory errors being indicated as other. But if that's now going to be under this unnamed or non-nameable uncategorized variant, no one can rely on out of memory being categorized that way because they can't name that way in the first place. They can only find that using like the underscore match uh, pattern. Uh, so this opens the, the door for them recategorizing many of these errors without being disruptive or without having to rely on the fact that someone might expect it to have it, its current error kind classification. We should emphasize too that this is only for the IO error kind. This is not like a broader error uh, type or trait. This is only for the IO module. Yeah, and, and uh, the IO error is a little bit special here in that it's used a lot in user code where you just propagate IO errors up through an entire stack. And so you sort of need this other variant in order for code to be able to sort of inject errors into that stack that don't really, that, that are IO errors, but they just don't directly map to any particular existing operating system error kind. And so I do think it makes sense to have the other variant here, but it's also the case that you need this other variant that can't be named so that it's not as disruptive to change the error kind of an existing error. And in fact, this is documented on the other error kind. Like if you if you look at it from like 152, for example, it says that for the other error kind variant, it says errors that are other may move to a different or new error kind variant in the future. It's not recommended to match an error against other and to expect any additional characteristics. So and in, yeah. th this was already the case for other. It's just now they're, they're formalizing it a bit more and sort of enforcing it a bit more. And in fact, several APIs have already begun uh, using uncategorized from other. So like, you know, they're no, no longer producing other than now making uncategorized. Yeah, and in fact, I think, I think they went through the standard library and changed everywhere that, that currently produce another to now produce uncategorized instead. This next one is, uh, is sort of a small change seemingly, right? So this is uh, open range patterns in match statements. The idea is that if you match on, say, an integer, you can say, I want to match on 0 to 4, and then I want to match on 5 and above. Previously, you could always match on ranges, but only if they were closed. But now you can say, like, 5 dot dot or 1 dot dot to say this and everything above or this and everything below, which really is a thing that I'm guessing people just expected to work in the past, and it just wasn't implemented, and now it is. And that's a it's just like a nice change to make things less unexpected maybe yeah it's uh it, it's not i don't think it's technically anything that you couldn't have achieved previously with an underscore pattern there but it is nice to have code be more self-documenting and not rely on because it is kind of like you know if you're ever writing a match statement you do notice from time to time that there's kind of an implicit uh semantics to the order in which you make your match statements uh with, you know, with the arms of your match statement where like you know like different conditions might overlap in this case, like, you know, if you, the example given is kind of like, if you have a, a zero on this number, you print zero, you have one dot dot, you print positive number. Uh, if you had instead written underscore, so that one dot dot, uh, and then if you ordered that arm above, then it would 
have different semantics. But if you have one dot dot there, it's actually it's both self documenting and it's resistant to any kind of like ordering that you might impose. So it's just a nice little quality of life thing. Yeah. There were a bunch of things that were new stabilized APIs in 155 too. I think the the one I want to talk about first is maybe uninit uh, gained a couple of new new methods. So maybe uninit is a I think we've talked about it briefly in the past. It's a type. So maybe uninit is generic over a T, and the idea is that it holds a T that may not be valid yet. Uh, so for example, it might hold a pointer or a reference that's currently all zeros, which is not a valid reference, or it might hold uh, a box that doesn't actually point to a heap allocation yet. And so the idea with maybe on in it is that you create one and then you sort of write into it, you write the appropriate bits into it to make it valid. And then you call assume in it, which is a method that already existed in order to get the T now that it is valid. Uh, so it sort of lets you keep a value in this sort of undetermined or not yet valid state, which otherwise isn't legal in, in Rust. You, you're not allowed to have, say, a box T that doesn't actually point to a T. And what was added in 155 were assume init mute and assume init ref. And these let you take a maybe on it, on init T and give you a mutable reference or a reference to that T, assuming that is now initialized. And this might seem a little odd, like if it's initialized, why shouldn't I just take ownership of it, and then I can borrow it afterwards. And the idea here is that there are some types where you might want to construct a valid version of one, but it wouldn't be valid for you to take ownership of it. An example of this might be an aliased box. So one rule of box is that you're not allowed to have two owned boxes that point to the same heap allocation. It's assumed that every box that you own, you own the underlying heap allocation as well. And But if you create a maybe uninit box T, then you can alias that because it's behind maybe uninit, so you don't need to follow the validity rules. But you couldn't call assume init on it because if you did, if you called assume init on both of them, you would now end up with aliased boxes, which is not legal. But with assume init ref, you can call that and get a reference to the box T. And that's okay. You can call that on both of them because the the borrowed box is not claiming that it has ownership and therefore is, is valid to, to have multiple of. So it's a long-winded way to say that this is this enables um, enables you to have more maybe uninit types or more use of maybe uninit for for types that are valid to to have references to, but not valid to, to take ownership of. This next one, this next stabilized API, uh, is actually born out of a broader initiative. Uh, so you've probably heard of the question mark operator in Rust. And in Rust, various operators can be overloaded. The question mark operator is not currently available to be overloaded. That's been something that's been under debate and uh, we've been working on for a long time now. And earlier this year, I believe it was uh, Scott MCM, I hope I think they're right, went through and uh, wrote a brand new RFC, a redesign for uh, what it would look like to overload the question mark operator. And this is known as the try trait. And uh, it so happens that one of the aspects of the try trait is uh, this new, it's also in the ops module, like try will be, it's called control flow. And John, do you want to talk about what's cool about control flow? Yeah, so control flow tries to sort of embody in the type system one particular aspect of try, which is, do you want to break or do you want to continue? So the idea here is that if you look at something like, well, if you look at the question mark operator, what the question mark operator really is saying is, if this is an error, then break. Otherwise, continue the control flow below the question mark operator with the sort of unwrapped value. And the same as if you have a question mark on option, right? If you have a none, then break as in return with none. Otherwise, continue with the T that was inside of the sum. Um, and control flow is essentially a, a type for encoding that decision. And in a way that's not tied to the return keyword, right? You could imagine that if you use a, let's say you use a question mark inside of a, 
Well, if you use it inside of a function or an async block, then it's it does mean return, right? If you if you get the break case, you return. But you could imagine that there are other cases where that's not really what you mean. Like you might want it to break a loop, for example, in certain contexts. Um, and control flow tries to sort of abstract away just that concept of a decision to continue or break. Now, there's, there's a larger discussion in the RFC of how this ties into the try trait. And we won't go into that too much yet because it's not it's not stabilized. I'm guessing it will be stabilized probably fairly soon. The design is pretty neat, but it basically relies on having a type that you can turn into and convert from these control flow decisions. And you can imagine that it's useful in other contexts just with try. So for example, imagine that you have a, on iterator, you have a try for each method. Well, try for each could take a closure that returns a control flow to dictate whether the for each has completed, and if so, completed with what, what value, or whether it should continue iterating, and if so, what is the sort of continuation parameter? Like what should be passed in to the next iteration of the closure? So it's just a, it's just a nice type for, for concisely expressing that notion of continue and break. And it's a stepping stone into getting, getting to the actual try trait. There was one other stabilized API that uh, is not super interesting, but I found it a lot of curious, which is drain as stir. So this is if you so you may have you may realize that if you have a vector, you can call drain on it in order to remove all the elements indicated by the range that you pass to drain, but keep the vector otherwise intact. So for example, if you have a vector of length five, you could say I want to drain elements two through four. And it gives you an iterator of the owned elements from two to four. And what it leaves behind in the vector is elements one and five. Those are both left in the vector and they're sort of shifted around so that they remain together. Well, strings, as in capital S string, also have a drain method that do sort of the same thing. You give it a range of characters inside the string, and you say, drain those characters out of the string, and then leave the remaining characters intact. And when you call drain, you get back a, a new type called drain. And that's the thing that implements iterator. And that drain type now has gained a method called as stir. And the idea here is that if you drain characters out of a string, the drain can give you a stir reference to the characters you have yet to drain. And that's what was added. And it sort of makes sense, right? Like you're removing a, you're basically removing a stir from a string. And so if you've removed some of the characters, this lets you get at what is the remainder of things that I haven't removed yet as a stir. It's just like a, it gives you an interesting insight into what, what drain does and sort of the, the uses that you might have for it. So I think um, I think that's all we had for the stabilized API. So I think all that's left is my my usual deep dive into the into the change log. And there's not too much of interest there. I think uh, for 155, there is there's one change which is the build scripts are now told about Rust flags and the Rust C wrapper and stuff. So this is if your cargo configuration includes sending additional flags to Rust C or has a wrapper around Rust C. Previously, build scripts weren't informed of that. And there are some crates that use build scripts to do things like determine whether they can use a nightly feature or not. And so they would break if you had Rust flags that that they didn't take into account. Um, that's passed in, which is kind of nice. Another one is that we now have cargo clippy dash dash fix stabilized. So we've, we've had cargo fix for a while for things like addition changes, but now, or, or even just like if the compiler can automatically fix a given warning or error, I think you can pass like cargo dash dash fix or just cargo fix. And now we have the same for Clippy. So if Clippy detects a, a lint that it thinks it can, it has like an automated fix for, you can just call cargo Clippy dash dash fix and it will fix those for you. There's also, speaking of Clippy, um, David Tolney has made this huge pass on all of crates.io to find Clippy lints that people were ignoring, like on purpose, were marking as like, allow this Clippy lint, with the idea that maybe some of these lint just shouldn't be on by default. Like maybe the users are telling us something here. 
And I think this is a really cool effort because it it means that the Clippilins are getting better over time at caring about the same things that Rust developers care about um, more generally. And really all this is saying is maybe consider removing some of your allow Clippy lints because the lints are improving and also the defaults for what is allowed are improving. And if you override them with allow, you may actually be missing out on important changes um, that don't have false positives that were hitting you in the past. I think the last one I had was that um, Rustock has gained this neat new feature where if you set doc hidden on a trait implementation, that trait implementation will not be shown in the list of implementations of traits for that type. It doesn't mean that that implementation doesn't exist. It just means that it doesn't show up in the documentation and doesn't clutter there. I, I think the use for this is like, if you have a type that implements lots of traits and those the fact that it implements the traits isn't important, maybe because it's an internal trait or something, or because you don't really want users to rely too much on it implementing this trait. Now, in practice, just because you market it as doc hidden doesn't really make it like okay to remove that implementation and not have it be a breaking change. But it does mean that at least you can make your generated documentation match your, your sort of documentation elsewhere about what users can and cannot rely on a little bit better. I think that's all I had for 155. Did you have anything else, Ben? No, that's good for me too. That's amazing. We've made it to such high numbers now. I think we have the high score. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, think about it. Like at what point, like, you know, Java, for example, I think it got to like, you know, maybe like 10 or 11 or 12 before it just said, screw it. We're no longer doing one point anything. We're just Java 12 now. So should we just start calling it like Rust 55, Rust 56? It is kind of tempting. I mean, the, the idea we don't is kind of like to emphasize, hey, we haven't like, you know, like we're still like committing to like, you know, all the, the breaking change commitment promise from uh, the original 1.0 release. So it could be a, a problem if in the future there ever was a Rust 2.0, because uh, then we'd have like, you know, you go from Rust 92 to Rust 2. But, uh, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, ben, <laughs> ben is announcing Rust 2.0. My 2. prediction. 0. I mean, take the over under. Uh, as we all know, Ben is the uh, the dictator for life of Rust. The uh, secret Illuminati has appointed me. Yes, that's right. And control. he has now declared that Rust 2.0 will happen. So mm -hmm. be careful, everyone. <laughs> You've got a while, though. Rust 92 is a while away. So Is it? I mean, we're like over halfway. <laughs> it's scary stuff. Uh -huh, Rust is uh -huh. getting old, man. Rust is. It's so old now. It's like It was like six years ago since we uh, released. So Yeah, that is crazy. I say we like I always do. So, I was there though. I was there. See, I was Still. expecting you to say I, but it, but I'm glad that you've uh, you've uh, leaned into your shadow a, public being master. part of the Rust Illuminati. It's it's a group effort. <laughs> That's right. I couldn't I couldn't shadow control the language all by myself. I got to give props to all the other folks here sitting in their chairs, smoking their cigars with their faces in shadow. See, this is you just throwing out the smoke screen. We all know it's just you, Ben. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am many. I am Legion. And with that note. <laughs> Let us end this podcast. Sounds good. All right. I'll see you for 156, Ben. See you then. Oh, should we uh, foreshadow what's going to happen next oh, time? Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. So in 156, and this is super secret. You didn't hear it from us. In 156, we're going to have a new Rust edition. But don't tell anyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's very exciting. I'm excited. Are you excited? I'm pretty excited. I mean, we did tell you about this last time a little bit. So I think uh, we're going to not do it three times in a row. We're going to only do it like, you know, give you a brief reprieve. But next time, expect plenty of edition related goodies and uh, tangents. Are, to, are we going to try to do a variant of Nico's edition song? Oh, we could. Uh, maybe we should like, you know, we should we should we should definitely rehearse. Not right now, not off the cuff, <laughs> but next time the outro can just be us singing the edition song. That is pretty fantastic. All right, see you for the 2021 edition in 156 in uh, 12 weeks from now. Farewell, folks. Stay safe out there. Bye. Bye.